uh, the SGF will make his remarks. The Minister of Health, followed by the National Coordinator, will present the technical updates, after which we shall take the questions. Please let me emphasize this evening that the day is fast spent, you need to file your reports. We shall appreciate simple, direct questions, no double-barreled questions, so that we, we can make it very, very compact for today. So I, I will now invite the chairman of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, the Secretary to Government of the Federation, Mr. Boss Mustafa, to make his remarks. Members of the Presidential Task Force, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, let me, in my own characteristic manner, once again, thank you for your patience. In the last one month, you have kept vigil with us every day, in spite of the fact that sometimes we are unable to do the national briefing within the stipulated time we've given you. I believe all is in the course of duty. I welcome you all to the briefing for Wednesday, 22nd April, 2020. As we are gradually moving towards the end of week four of the lockdown for Lagos or Gun, as well as the Federal Capital Territory, the Presidential Task Force has intensified its all-round assessment of the impact on the stated objectives the state of readiness and next steps to take. As we speak, the DG of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control and the WHO representative are expected back in Abuja later today with their reports from nine states. The Presidential Task Force notes that the amount of cases has risen generally. This is attributable to expansion of our testing capacity and activities as well as evidence that community spread is taking place. Considering the dynamic nature of the response plan, the strategy for testing has been modified and door-to-door -door testing is now taking place in some communities in Lagos and Abuja. Testing, detection, isolation, care and case management remain central to our success in this fight. The situation in Kano continues to be of concern and the Presidential Task Force is working in close contact with the state government to arrest the situation. The Presidential Task Force will update you as soon as there are new developments. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind us all that this pandemic is real and is spreading like wildfire. We must all arise to fight this potent an invisible common enemy by adhering to the guidelines and protocols for COVID-19, which includes personal hygiene, social distancing, wear of masks in public places, obeying the stay-at-home order, and reporting unusual illness to the authorities for investigation. It is anticipated that by Friday, 24th of April, by the grace of God, the Ramadan season shall commence. I want to use this medium to thank His Eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, 
and the President General of the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs for endorsing the recommendations of the Emergency Fatwa Committee by issuing a statement guiding the conduct of the Ummah during the Ramadan. The statement has directed the Ummah on the suspension of obligatory religious activities such as Jumat, congregational, and other sessions during the month of Ramadan to prevent the spread of COVID-19. It similarly encouraged scholars and organizations to use all other means of communication and brokers to disseminate information and conduct programs. Our prayer is that the Almighty shall accept our collective supplication and show mercy. I similarly commend the application of these directives in the states and implore all state governors to please consider these directives before taking further decisions. I am pleased to inform you that as a show of magnanimity and concern for all categories of employees, Mr. President has approved the immediate payment of the withheld February and March 2020 salaries of lecturers not registered on the IPPIS platform. This payment is to cushion the deleterious effect of the COVID-19 period on the lecturers and members of their families. However, all vice chancellors are to revalidate the BVN of the affected lecturers before the Accountant General of the Federation can carry out the payments. The Presidential Task Force remains committed to leading the fight against COVID-19 and crave your support, understanding, and cooperation. Your constructive ideas for improvement will always be most welcome. I now invite the Honorable Minister of Health for his update, and I thank you most sincerely for listening. Good afternoon. The Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Honorable Ministers, Directors General, Directors here, ladies and gentlemen of the press. As of today, the 22nd of April 2020, 782 people, as of this morning, in 24 states and federal capital territory, have been confirmed to have the COVID-19 infection. The 117 new cases represent the highest daily increase in new cases so far and is one indication of more efficient testing and increasing community transmission. The most affected states are Lagos with 59, Federal Capital Territory with 29, Kano with 14, Bono with six, Ogun with three, Katsina four, and one each, Bauchi Rivers, and all the others. 25 deaths have sadly been recorded in total, and 197 people have been successfully treated for COVID-19 and discharged. With regard to Kano and the news around there, the Federal Minister of Health through the Chief Consultant Epidemiologist has been with the Public Health Department of Kano State and also 16 officers from NCDC were there to find out what was true about the news of burials going on there. They took place in the Gwale, Dala, Kombotso, Taraumi, Nasarawa and the Kano municipal local governments. The state 
public health department is still looking into it to find out if these burials were out of normal and they are carrying out uh, further questioning of people to see what was peculiar about the uh, story. Since there was no record and no test done uh, of the uh, deceased, the answer will come up in a few days' time when the epidemiologists bring their results. Yesterday, the 21st of April, the Ministry of Health convened the successful Emergency National Council on Health meeting via teleconference, where State Commissioners of Health and the Acting FCT Secretary for Health were engaged to review the status and align all response to COVID-19 outbreak in the country. Some of the resolutions unanimously adopted are that all persons diagnosed with COVID-19 be henceforth preferably treated in the state where the diagnosis was made rather than to be referred to another state or to their state of origin, except there is a medical indication for it. This is to avoid the high risk of exposure of other persons in the course of transfer. Patent and proprietary medicine vendors and pharmacists and chemists are henceforth prohibited from attempting to treat persons diagnosed with or suspected to be COVID-19 patients. Otherwise, their licenses may be canceled. Private hospitals desiring to manage COVID-19 patients apply to their state ministries of health for the permit, and they must meet the standard IPC infection prevention and control standards and be accredited by a state accreditation team according to the guidelines developed by the Federal Ministry of Health before they are granted that permit. States should, will notify the Federal Ministry of Health of the isolation and treatment centers for inclusion on the COVID-19 health management information system plat platform. This is for better coordination of national response. 27 rapid response teams are deployed to states by NCDC as at now to support the response and the most recent ones are to Abia, Gombe and Sokoto states. Active case finding is ongoing in communities with evidence of person-to-person -person transmission. This strategy requires more testing and diagnostics and we are working to increase the capacity and activate additional laboratories, both public and private, for COVID-19 testing, with the final purpose of having one or more public health laboratory with PCR capability in every state. Citizens are reminded that COVID-19 has a recovery rate of over 90%. If those with the typical symptoms report early enough for testing and treatment or quarantine, it can save you from severe complications of the infection and also help to reduce the spread and save loved ones from getting infected. Everyone who has a symptom of that nature should call the Center of Nigeria Center for Disease Control uh, or the state emergency number. If you suspect yourself or anyone around you may have a COVID infection of that type. Again, because of the risks involved, those with existing medical conditions like diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, TB, HIV, cancer, are advised to take special care and to obey the injunctions for preventing infection because this group of people are known 
to be more vulnerable than others. To ensure best treatment options for Nigerians, a protocol for a patient ambulance transport system has been developed for FCT and it is to be set up in all other states of the Federation. It is meant to smoothly convey patients to specialized treatment centers or between treatment centers as medically indicated. Nigeria Air Force and NEMA have also kindly have put an aircraft on standby for use for this same purpose if need be. I want to applaud all the health workers in the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic and urge them to take necessary precautions for their own safety. Some healthcare workers have already lost their lives in the less than two months since COVID-19 appeared, and many dozens, including doctors, are idling away in quarantine. Our health system cannot afford many more health workers being put out of service, and hence I once again appeal to all those who have the necessary information to give the information to healthcare workers, not to hide any information, not to mislead doctors or nurses, and to cooperate in the treatment that they are supposed to get. We must not underrate the infectious power of the coronavirus. I must stress the need again for sound knowledge of infection prevention and control protocol to be eligible for consideration to manage this infection. And I also remind health workers to be vigilant, to make sure that they protect themselves and not to take any risk in the line of duty. Again, as we have always said, we advise the use of tissue, handkerchief, when you are coughing or sneezing, or to sneeze or cough into your elbow to avoid spreading this infection to people around you. I also again remind all of our citizens to avoid mass gathering, to practice hand and respiratory hygiene, and physical distancing, and to cancel all non-essential travel out of the place where you reside. This is not a time to go outside the safety of your home. And remember also to wash and sun dry or iron your, your reusable cloth mask, or if you are using a face covering, attend to it every day. Stay home and take all precautions carefully. Um, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen of the press. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to say that my attention has been drawn to um, fake um, task force media statements referencing um, turbulent times ahead, which was said to be signed by me, and uh, I proposed uh, talking about a proposed complete lockdown of the country. And not only is the statement uh, patently fails, it's also badly written. It is unfortunate that um, a small number of persons continue to engage in mischief making at such a serious time when we are talking about coronavirus infection. I must reiterate that the task force has not released any official statement on a complete lockdown. I refer to the SGF's uh, speech yesterday on submitting formal findings to Mr. President. This is yet to happen. I request that the public and the media exercise caution in circulating or publishing un unverified news. Uh, to be very clear, all formal statements on the emergency response are made through this daily press conference or through official press statements. I am asking for all parts of the media to continue to work with us to prevent the spread of divisive and harmful fake news. Um, I would also like to upload all those patients that have recovered from COVID-19 and are now sharing their experiences on their own volition. This step is extremely helpful 
in countering the wrong stigma around COVID infection. When we stigmatize persons, when we discriminate against them, when we scorn people, what happens is that they go into hiding at a time when they need help and support, and it makes our job the more difficult. We can only flatten the curve if people come out willingly to report symptoms based on the case specifications, like a fever, like a dry cough, or like um, shortness of breath. We need to encourage more people to come out with symptoms so that we can test them and isolate them appropriately. I'd like to remind the public that just as the Honorable Minister of Health said, the majority of persons with coronavirus infection will get well. That in the Chinese cohort, 92% of those that had COVID recovered fully. Um, I'll also like to acknowledge um, the issue of the lockdown and the potential impact this might be having on people, particularly in terms of uh, getting their daily meals, buying food, etc. The federal government uh, recognizes this and we are grateful for the support we continue to have and the understanding we continue to have uh, with the public. We are working uh, to get palliatives to the most vulnerable and we are also working very closely with state governments to ensure that these hardships are mitigated. We ask Nigerians to please come together to overcome this adversity. Let us help our neighbors, let us help the elderly, let us help family members and friends that are less, fortu um, less fortunate in this difficult um, period. Finally, I would like to talk about face masks. We would like to continue to encourage persons to wear face masks, particularly when coming out in public or interacting in closed spaces. However, it is important to remember that the use of face masks is most effective if we continue to do in combination those other measures that we know help, such as hand washing, hand disinfection, physical distancing, respiratory hygiene, and avoiding mass gatherings. Thank you. Thank you very much. We shall now take the questions. Our, our colleagues ready? Okay. Please let me appeal to our colleagues once again uh, to please make it straight and sharp so that uh, we can wrap this up very fast. Thank you. Good, sir, the chairman and uh, members of ETF. My name is Femi Ogunshala with the News Agency of Nigeria. Sir, Kogi State Governor said recently that the state has an app for checking COVID-19. Has PTF confirmed the authenticity of this uh, app? And are you going to leverage on this to replicate it across the country if it is true? Then secondly, sir, to the Minister of Education, there is a press release being circulated, especially on social media, that school are to resume in November. Is this true? Can you confirm or debunk this? And if this is true, sir, the, to the Minister of Information, sir, what are you doing to actually curtail uh, the spread of uh, fake news? How many people have been brought to book for this? Thank you. Please let me appeal to our colleagues once again uh, to please make it straight and sharp so that uh, we can wrap this up very fast. Thank you. Good day, sir, the chairman and uh, members of PTF. My name is Femi Ogunshala with the News Agency of Nigeria. Sir, Kogi State Governor said recently that the state has an app for checking COVID-19. Has PTF confirmed the authenticity of this uh, app? And are you going to leverage on this to replicate it across the country if it is true? Then secondly, 
So to the Minister of Education, there is a press release being circulated, especially on social media, that school are to resume in November. Is this true? Can you confirm or debunk this? And if this is true, sir, the, to the Minister of Information, sir, what are you doing to actually curtail uh, the spread of uh, fake news? How many people have been brought to book for this? Thank you. Good afternoon, sirs. My name is Friday Okeribe. I'm a reporter with Chinese TV. My first question has to do with uh, the Chinese uh, medical experts that came. They were put in a quarantine for 14 days. The 14 days has, el has elapsed. So what next? I'd like the Minister of Health to tell us about that. The second question has to do with uh, testing in Kano. As we speak, they've suspended the testing. And the reason for suspending it, according to one official, it is because they have run out of test kits and reagents. What can the PTF do to help them? Thank you. My name is Felix Onua. My name is Felix Onua. Felix Onua, and I write for Reuters. My, my question is for the Minister of Interior. Um, there are some foreign nationals that are in Nigeria that during this um, lockdown have their resident permits and visas expired, but they cannot renew it during this lockdown. What is the tax for team to help them out so that they would not be tagged as illegal, they are, that they are residing in the country illegally. Then secondly, my next question is uh, for the chairman of the tax force. Chairman, from your assessments of the level you have attained, your achievement so far, uh, from the first lockdown and then this current lockdown that ends Monday next week, uh, will you be able to tell us that by the end of this lockdown, there won't be need for a further lockdown, or from the kind of statistics we are getting from NCDC, which you had attested about the upsurge, do you think there will still be a further lockdown, or this time a national lockdown? Good evening, all. Rachel Abuja from the News Agency of Nigeria. Now that uh, we've decided to go for aggressive testing, how committed is our primary healthcare centers in the country in fighting against this virus? Now, um, Honorable Minister for Health, sir, I would like to know if uh, the part environmental health officers are playing in terms of bearing um, COVID patients. Secondly, um, we have, um, what do you call, Abuja is said to be epic center for these infections. We are yet to get um, cases from Nasarawa and Kogi State. I don't know if we are worried. Thank you very much. Good evening all. My name is Nike Adebowale. I report for Premium Times. So my question is for the Minister of Health. So at the beginning of this month, you said Nigeria now has the capacity to um, test about 1,500 persons. And um, if we were to go by that, like 1st of April till now, maybe with 20 days, if it times 1, 5 times 20, that's about 30,000 people. But as of today, Nigeria has tested just about a little over 8,000 people, sir. So can you explain this gap? Also, um, what are the constraints to mass testing? Thank you. Good evening, sirs. Uh, my name is Juliana Atai Wabaloyan. I write for Sun Newspapers. Minister of Education, this is for you, please. It's an 
SOS um, from scholars abroad. So they say they are here to get their payments and they are wondering if uh, the federal government is considering them that they are in their need. Um, um, maybe the Minister of uh, Health can answer this, that 17 doctors were sent to a National Women Development Center. Um, they were quarantined there for, uh, and the days have elapsed. But they said um, the guest house is complaining that they are feeding accommodation. Everything has not been paid for. So maybe you might want to respond to that. Good evening, all. My name is Helen Osamede Ekins. I report for TVC News. My question is for the Minister of Health. Sir, there are some reports that the virus still remain in the tests, testes of men, even after testing negative to the coronavirus. How can this be ascertained? The Chairman, National Coordinator, Honorable Ministers, my colleagues. My name is Amaka Ude. I report for Arise News. And uh, I have a question for the Minister of Health. Well, several times, sir, you have told us on this platform that we have enough personal protective equipment for our healthcare professionals. But Arise News have actually gone to several hospitals, even here in Abuja and in Lagos, and people who require services, especially pregnant women, they've been asked to bring two PPEs before they are attended to. So I want to know what the PTF has got to say about that. And also, you've also promised here on this platform that uh, our frontline workers, you are working on a package for them. You called it the hazard allowance. We haven't gotten an update concerning that, so would like one. Because yesterday we had the president of the Nigerian Medical Association and he says nothing has come except for Lagos, which the governor has actually even upped the pay from 5,000 to 25,000. But other medical frontline workers all across the country will want to know the update. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman and members of the Presidential Task Force. Good evening, colleagues and Nigerians at home. My name is Mitaire Ikwen. I report for the Nigerian Television Authority. The Minister of Information yesterday warned against patronage of a fake COVID-19 vaccine circulating in Kanu. We want to ask, is this responsible for reports of multiple deaths in Kanu? Secondly, I want to ask, is every case of fever related to the coronavirus? I ask because some Nigerians are complaining of not being attended to when they go to the hospitals because they complain of having a fever. And uh, thirdly, you remember yesterday I asked what, uh, whether the PTF is considering a review of strategy as it has to do with the market days in the Federal Capital Territory. Today was one of such market days, and the metropolitan markets like um, the Utako and the Garaki markets were filled to the brim, overcrowded, with uh, no observance of uh, social distancing. So I want to know if uh, such markets like Utako and Garaki, if they, if, they, if they amount to neighborhood markets. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, members of the tax force. My name is Nancy Oedia or I'm from AIT. My question is for the Minister of Foreign Affairs, sir. So on Monday, you mentioned that about 200 uh, people will be evacuated in diaspora and will be distributed in Abuja and Lagos. I've spoken to some of them in diaspora, and they said if they have to wait for 200 people to be evacuated, it means some of them may stay till a month or two months, and they did not prepare for some of uh, the hazards that, uh, they, uh, that may take place in those places. So they are appealing, if you can partner with uh, some of the hotels in some of the cities like Lagos and Abuja, you know, for, for them to 
have more spaces so that you can evacuate more than maybe three, four, five hundred at a go, so that uh, maybe 1,000 people in two weeks will be in Nigeria. There are also some other people who said they are based outside the country and they are stuck here in Nigeria. There are plans uh, that you can uh, assist them to take them back to uh, their countries. And some of them also in diaspora said they do not have the money to pay for their flights. If the federal government can also assist them in that regard. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I, I want to thank you for making it very brisk today. Uh, the questions have come in. Uh, they are directed at the Honorable Minister of Health, the National Coordinator, Honorable Minister of Interior, Honorable Minister of Information and Culture, Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs, and uh, uh, Honorable Minister of State Education and the Secretary to Government of the Federation. We shall begin with the Honorable Minister of Health. So I thank you for your very interesting questions and uh, we'll start at the beginning. The question of the treatment of COVID-19 infection with herbs, uh, I think it's popped up before and we have said that we are interested in all the remedies that are proposed if it works. Uh, the Ministry of Health has a department for traditional complementary and alternative medicine, so anything that is uh, thought to have efficacy should be brought forward and we we'll gladly look through it. Uh, since nobody is uh, really, really uh, known to be uh, uh, immune, but probably not showing uh, symptoms, there are people who might uh, have uh, asymptomatic version of uh, the uh, infection and if you have taken something you might think that that uh, took care of it. Now uh, I was reminded um, that the people, the people who came from China had spent 14 days in quarantine and I ordered that the test be done, the COVID-19 uh, test swabs uh, to be taken I think tomorrow and the test will be done to finalize if any of them has any uh, infection. Um, as for the testing in Kano, there was a report that they had reduced availability of reagents and they were supplied that. But in addition to that, there was a temporary halt in activities because uh, some of the workers in a laboratory got uh, infected and the laboratory had to be shut down for decon decontamination. That was just temporary. But the, with regard to supplies with reagents, they have been replenished. They have the PPE, they have reagents now, and they are working. Now, the role of primary health care. Primary health care is very important in this exercise in the sense that now we are in the community transmission phase we are past that era when people used to think that the coronavirus infection was something for uh, big men and big women who came from abroad. And uh, because they came from abroad, uh, they, they are the ones who suffer from it, uh, and they were not concerned. But now that, that it has gone to community level, it is really down at the uh, grassroots, and the role of the primary health care comes into play and it is uh, very important for them to be able to do the surveillance, the, to raise the index of suspicion, to find persons who should go for treatment, sometimes to move around the community and be able to identify people who might have symptoms but have not presented, have not gone to a uh, facility and to encourage them to go. So as a lot of, as a result of those who are driving, they are playing the role of driving uh, the demand, and uh, encouraging uh, people not to be uh, worried about uh, uh, going for the test. 
The Environment Ministry plays also an important role, and that is why you know that the Ministry of Environment is in this committee. As you know, they are responsible for sanitation, they are responsible for decontamination and fumigation. So if your, uh, even if your, uh, you order anything from overseas and it comes, uh, the Ministry of uh, Environment is responsible for decontaminating it before you accept it. They are also responsible for decontamination, decontaminating hospitals or ambulances after they have been used for um, taking uh, an infected person somewhere. But you also see places where the Ministry of Environment decontaminates whole areas of town. If you have seen them in some clips or some movies, or uh, some clips uh, or some reports where they are spraying uh, uh, whole areas of a city or a market or a public square. So they play an extremely important role here. Now with the testing, uh, I've said before that we do um, calculated testing. We do what I would call smart testing in that you look for all those who are likely to be in that age, in that bracket, those who have the uh, symptoms, those who have the travel history, those who are contacts, and now we are doing house to house uh, and cluster testing for people who live in an environment where you have seen many uh, positives. If you have seen many positives in the second area, you send your men there to take samples to test in that area. Uh, that is like a, a cluster testing, which has been very helpful in being able to identify cases. That's why you see so many of them now being discovered uh, in the Lagos area and also in Abuja. Now, the with the uh, story about the storage of uh, uh, coronavirus in testes anatomically, where it has been claimed, some people claim that it has been, um, it is the reason why you have a ratio of infected people of 70 to 30, 70 men are infected for every 30 women. And uh, the claim is that it is because the um, um, for some reason, the virus finds a place to hide in the testes and continues from there to recirculate and becomes more stubborn than uh, with the female. So that is not, uh, well, that is uh, a contention, we call it now. Uh, as for the hazard allowance, the work is still going on. Within the next uh, week, you will hear what the result is. We have been talking about it. It was also a subject matter today. It has not yet been finalized. We have met with all the stakeholders. We've met with the organizations. We've met with doctors. We have compared uh, also the uh, rates uh, that, or rather the promises that were made and also the uh, rates that may have been used in other places. So the result will come with time. With PPE, pers uh, personal protective equipment is one of the most precious commodities you can think of now. There are countries who are telling you that they are short. And if you read the news or listen to news, you'll find that even the UK are saying that they are very short. They can't find enough PPE for their health workers. And uh, this morning, it said that they were trying to buy a plane load of, uh, the UK was trying to buy a plane load of uh, PPE from Turkey and they had sent an aircraft to go and collect it. There were some issues about the delay in supplying. So we have always said that we are looking for a good stockpile because we want to be able to protect our frontline health workers to make sure they don't run short. We have also uh, told them to use these things very, these uh, uh, commodities very judiciously and uh, not to waste them because they are extremely scarce in the, in the market. Uh, there, there's a global scarcity, a global shortage of PPEs. So I'm sure our health workers are listening to us. We are exploring the possibility of procuring from local manufacturers because some manufacturers have come up to say that they are able to make PPE for us, which will gladden our hearts very well because we shall, with that way, encourage local industry, local manufacturing. And we are going to go into talks with them uh, for that. So PPE, there's no country that they will tell you, that will tell you now they have enough PPE. We don't have enough, but we have enough for the purpose of the, that we are in at this time. And we are definitely looking for more. Uh, we shall continue to, we are 
placing order. Uh, we shall continue to welcome uh, donations of PPE so that our health workers do not have to fear, like other countries where they have to use uh, uh, the plastic from uh, waste bins to cover themselves because they run completely out. Now, with regards to doctors, yes, you know that uh, what happens is that uh, NCDC workers who go out into the field to do things, uh, certain activities, when they come back, they go into quarantine for some time uh, and they just to observe themselves because of their families also, because you don't just come back from uh, this assignment and go straight to your family. So they go into uh, routine quarantine for 14 days and then they know that they are okay before they can go home to their family. So it's not a sort of punitive uh, thing, it's a routine measure that is taken for the safety of their um, uh, families. Now, the other question is about fever. All fever is not corona-related. Uh, you know that malaria is endemic in this country, so malaria will give you fever. Uh, many viral infections uh, of different types will also give you fever. And corona is just one of them. Fever is not an illness, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of several illnesses of which corona is one. So once you see someone who has fever and uh, you are thinking of corona, of course, you mustn't forget to think of malaria also. If you do that, then you have missed something or think of any other kind of infection or an infection like even tonsillitis or appendicitis. All these, are, they can also give you fever. And uh, the doctor will just be careful enough to have the index of suspicion while looking at all the possibilities not to forget the corona and take necessary action on that. Yes, it does have a, um, cause fever, but it's not the only one that causes fever. During, well, there's a protocol for it, and the that particular procedure has, there's a department, there's a, there's a section in the Department of Public Health uh, of the Federal Ministry of Health that's responsible for that, for uh, safe and dignified burials uh, of uh, persons with, uh, with infectious diseases. And uh, I believe that the, at the Ministry of Environment works with the Ministry of Health in order to go to see that that part of it is well uh, created. So everything is already uh, looked into, and the uh, uh, office, their officers who are in charge, and the relationship they have with the uh, environment. I think you know that the environment plays a role in everything that uh, connects, many things that connect health, uh, uh, the, the health sector. We are like. Mr. Chairman and uh, my colleagues in the House, uh, I just got this on my phone right now. Apparently, the governor, His Excellency of uh, Governor Yahya Belu, reacting to, uh, I think, a question asked in respect of um, uh, testing. So it says, I'm just reading out what he sent to my phone just now. That the last reporter lied. I did not say we have app for testing. We simply developed a web-based link to ascertain the vulnerability of Kogi citizens. This is my short reaction. So he is spreading fake news. <laughs> Kogi governor, Yahaya Belo. And uh, he puts the, the website kogicovid19.com.ng. Thank you. The national coordinator, please. Thank you. So I, I believe there were just a few questions. The first one had to do with um, aggressive um, laboratory testing. How committed are we in terms of using primary health care facilities? So yes, we are. We are looking at every, every possibility when it comes to expanding testing. And there are a lot of bottlenecks. Some of the bottlenecks are less to do with laboratories. They are more to do with the operational efficiency and also the availability of easy 
sampling sites. Um, so like um, in Lagos, for instance, they have a, a lot of centers where people can go and get tested, and we are looking at that model. Uh, we also have the chief executive of prim uh, the Nigeria Primary Healthcare Agency already, um, Dr. Faisal Shaibu, he's part of the task force now, and uh, we, are, we are working with him closely to see what we can do to expand um, testing. So um, all options are on the table, so to speak. The other question had to do with um, the COVID virus remaining in the testes of men. What do we do about this? So um, at the moment, there's no evidence of uh, sexual transmission when it comes to COVID. But of course, we're still in the early days of the disease. Um, the same thing happened with Ebola, where subsequently it was proven that um, it was sexually transmitted. There was a small case series of 10 women who, uh, who had severe COVID pneumonia and uh, genital secretions were negative for COVID virus. Um, I think it's still early days. I'll just say watch this space. Um, the most important thing to remember is that COVID is transmitted. It's a respiratory tract infection. So anything that brings you into close proximity with an infected person, you could easily catch COVID, whether it's um, uh, from coughing or whether it is from sneezing or from touching of contaminated surfaces, etc. That's the main transmission route at the moment. Um, finally, the issue of uh, market days. And the question is, is Otako Garki markets still part of the neighborhood markets? So, of course, the answer is no, they are not. Um, the market days are controlled by the FCT. Uh, we are working on a protocol post-COVID for the markets. Um, I think it's useful for the public to know that after the COVID pandemic, uh, things are going to change. I don't think things will ever be the same. The way we interact with each other, the way we, so we, we do our normal day-to-day -day activities will definitely change because um, COVID um, has, um, has changed the world, so to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Honorable Minister of Interior. Afternoon, afternoon all. The question is, what are we doing with uh, aliens on expatriate quota, temporary work permit, and I had residence permits, and even visas, expired visas. What are we doing with them? Two weeks ago, the Immigration Service made an announcement to Nigerians, which the papers carried, that because of the lockdown and the shutdown of all international entry points to Nigeria, particularly the airport, we have waived all conditions pertaining to visa, temporary work permit, residence permit, and a statutory quota for those who are affected till the end of the lockdown and when the international airports are opened, except for citizens whose nations are arranging evacuation. And that is allowed and permitted. That answers the question. I thank you. Honorable Minister of Information and Culture. I believe there are two questions. The first is that uh, whether the death being reported in Kano has anything to do with the fake um, COVID-19 uh, vaccine. I don't think there's any evidence to that effect. And the second issue is um, what are we doing about fake news? I want to assure you that the security agencies are working around the clock to apprehend and unveil those who are behind this uh, spit of fake news. Clearly, it's no use appealing to them. We stop appealing to them. And um, I can assure you that very soon, they'll be unmasked and they'll be paraded. Uh, no government anywhere in the world can sit down and watch fake news merchants destabilize the, the polity 
I was, re I was reading the Ghanaian president's address when he was uh, lifting um, a partial restriction on the lockdown in Ghana. And he also made special mention of fake news and determination of government to go after the marchers and purveyors of fake news. So Nigeria will not be an exception. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, there are three questions uh, I think that I could make out uh, that were asked. Uh, the first is about uh, increasing the numbers uh, of those, uh, um, you know, to make it uh, easier. Otherwise, the time they have to stay uh, will be longer, and some of them, of course, you know, uh, have um, financial challenges and other challenges. Well, you know, um, we, we took medical advice. I mean, we asked the medical people um, what was possible, and um, the figure we were given uh, was uh, 200 for Lagos and 200 for Abuja. Uh, of course, this is, um, you know, uh, much less than the numbers that are waiting uh, to come back. But um, we're just constrained by the facilities that are available. And, um, you know, and unfortunately, I mean, because we have the challenges, internal challenges, you know, as you can see, the figures are going up, you know, all the time. And um, so, you know, we, we have a great responsibility to also ensure that these facilities are also there to deal with the immediate challenges we're facing uh, back home. But, um, you know, if the opportunity presents itself and we find that, you know, more facilities become available, then of course we would, you know, uh, look at the possibility of expanding and increasing the numbers of people that, that we can bring back. But the fact of the matter is that at this moment, uh, these are the, this is a framework uh, in which we've been told that we can uh, operate. Um, then all, yeah, in fact, the other point you make, I must confess, is, uh, is new to me. Um, I mean, it's one that, it makes sense, but uh, I certainly had never thought about it, of Nigerians who are here, who are based overseas, presumably who are not nationals of foreign countries, and who are trying to get back. But I wouldn't know if they were not nationals of those countries, um, or maybe just reside in there, why they would want necessarily uh, to go back. I mean, it won't be for schooling, it won't be for, for work, uh, I would imagine, uh, at this point in time. So, um, so it's, it's, it's not quite you know, uh, clear to me, but I, you know, I have to say that um, at the moment, that is not the category of people that we had uh, in mind. You know, we're looking at the more pressing and immediate a challenge of bringing the uh, thousands of Nigerians who are uh, trapped outside and want to come back, uh, come back home. And um, you know, of course, the um, the financial aspect of this uh, is one that we're also very mindful of. Um, you know, we have some students who are, are stuck in Khartoum in Sudan. Um, of course, we have to bend over backwards because they are students, young, uh, you know, uh, young children, um, to, to to find the resources, you know, to try to um, uh, to to take them uh, to pay for their return and also for their two-week um, uh, isolation. But um, but unfortunately, for all the others. We just don't have the financial resources, you know. Um, well, as you know, as you can see, you know, the, the huge amounts of money that we're having to, um, you know, to, to, to pay uh, for various aspects, you know, of, of the challenge. So unfortunately, and it's a source of great regret for the government, you know, that we are not in a position you know, to pay. If we had the resources, we'll be more than happy to pay for everybody to come home uh, free of charge, to pay for their stay uh, in our isolation centers for, for two weeks. But the reality is we just don't, you know, and um, 
and that's just the situation for, for now. And then in terms of the timelines, you know, um, we had hoped to have started already uh, the evacuation process. Um, but we have um, huge numbers of our you know, brothers and sisters uh, um, all around the world. And um, you know, we really want to get it right. You know? uh, it's such a delicate uh, exercise. I mean, we've seen with some of the other countries um, who have been evacuating their nationals from, uh, from Nigeria, some of the you know, uh, real horror stories that um, you know, intending passengers have had to undergo in Lagos, at Lagos Airport. And we want to avoid you know, those kinds of uh, situations and make sure that we get everything right. And that might unfortunately necessitate you know, our taking a little bit longer, uh, but just to make sure that we get it absolutely right. And then you know, by God's grace, um, we'll be able to get uh, as many of the people who want to come back home, back home as possible. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister of State Education. Well, to say thank you, um, uh, good evening, everybody. Well, two things. Um, the students who have not received their funds, I'm not sure who they are, but right now the Ministry of Education is not running at full speed. So if there are outstanding, I'm sure that um, uh, whoever they are, they can let us know, and then we can figure out what branch of the scholarship schemes they are on. All our students that went out on scholarship, we did uh, cater for all of them fully before they left, uh, whether they are bilaterals, whether they are BAEs, whether they are Commonwealth, all our scholarship students are um, adequately catered for. And there are no gaps, whether they are TED fund, it, every of the scholarships are complete and we have provisions that had already been made uh, with CBN with all of them and all of them are, or, so I don't know where the gaps may be or if there are specific issues around that and their remittances, then please uh, address those to me and then we can get uh, the skeletal staff that is working to look at that. Um, for the first question on a letter that is circul in circulation, um, you've heard other ministers tell you, most of this is fake news. If we're going to be issuing any directive at this time, it will be coming from us. It wouldn't be a letter that is circulated on uh, some social network platform. People should discountenance that. I have a copy of uh, what was sent to me, and uh, the dates, the language, the grammar, the tenses, all of that is wrong. That immediately indicates to you that that can't possibly be coming from the Ministry of Education. Thank you very much. I now invite the Secretary to Government. I thought all the questions have been taken, but uh, I think there's one particular one that uh, had to do with the issue of assessment of the lockdown. And uh, uh, it's quite clear uh, in my opening remarks that I said uh, as we uh, towards as we are approaching the end of uh, the week four of the lockdown of these areas, we have intensified uh, our all-round assessment of the impact on the stated objectives. In the first place, we had objectives that were stated that we wanted to achieve, and we are looking at that vis-a-vis -vis the times that have lapse and to see whether those objectives have been achieved. Also to assess our state of readiness and prepare ourselves for the next steps to be taken. If you notice, uh, the DG has not been with us for a couple of days with the representative or the country rep of the World Health Organization is because they have gone out there to the fields to have a first-hand assessment of the things that we set out to achieve. And we're expecting them back this evening, and tomorrow we'll interrogate their report 
along with other modelings that we have received of what next steps to take. It's a combination of so many factors. We are looking at the nation, we are looking at the lives of the nation, we are looking at the economy, we are looking at the total well-being of our people before we can arrive at a very informed position that would facilitate the kind of advice that we'll give to the president at the end of the, uh, the, the time of uh, the second segment of the declaration of quarantine in these three areas. And it's, it's a complex thing. And I can assure you that as we progress, within the next couple of days, working very, very hard to see how we move. We have, we have acknowledged that to a large extent, the reasons for the lockdown have become quite evident. We've expanded our testing, we've expanded our tracing and tracking, and isolation and testing and that accounts for the kind of figures you see or cases you see being reported on a daily basis. And we've been able to also now modify the strategy a little bit to accommodate the exigencies that have presented themselves. And that's why we have introduced the door-to-door -door testing in the two cities, Lagos and Abuja, which have presented themselves as the epicenter of this pandemic. Uh, I know that at the end of our evaluation and assessment, we will be able to form a very considered opinion that would inform whatever recommendations we will send to Mr. President as to the next line of actions. I wouldn't want, like I've insisted from yesterday, to indulge myself with speculations as to what would happen. Ours as a task force is to make recommendations and the decision is ultimately to be taken by the president himself. So I would um, uh, uh, want to assure you that as a task force, we are doing everything within our capacity and based on the information that is available to us, what we see and what we project will happen in the future to advise based on that. But I can assure you that whatever advice we give will be for the good of the people of this nation and for the betterment, our, for our betterment of our health and our wealth as a people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's uh, national briefing. I must say a big thank you to our uh, media partners for taking this briefing right to the homes of uh, uh, 100, uh, 200 million Nigerians. And uh, the reaction coming in from Kogi State shows that even at the executive level, uh, attention is being paid to this sacrifice that you are making. You are broadcasting live without charging a penny. We, we thank you very much.